Genesis chapter 22 and verse 9. The Bible says, And they came to the place which God had told them of. So remember, Abraham and Isaac, they were heading toward the place that God told him to go. So they were heading toward that direction. And then it reads here, and God, uh, no, not God, and Abraham built an altar there. So that's self-explanatory. Abraham, he built an altar himself up there, I'm sure with his son Isaac's help, and laid the wood in order. So he put the wood in order and bound Isaac his son. Then he tied up Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. So he laid Isaac his son on the altar on top of the wood. The question in everybody's mind, obviously, is how did a man who is over 100 years old do that? There's no way that he could have done it. Well, if we were to keep looking at Genesis 22 and follow the logic and the rationale that Isaac and Abraham are picturing God the Father giving up his only begotten son, where Isaac, picturing Jesus Christ, is being crucified for the sins of the world. Now, the pictures are undoubtedly strong. The reason why is, one, we've seen too many scriptural comparisons. Two, is because it is prophecy itself. How did Abraham see Christ's day, which we discussed in our last Genesis study teaching? right? So the Bible demands the strong comparison between these two, that they have to be both together. They have to be both together. So if Isaac is picturing Jesus Christ and that, and Isaac has to continue on with that picture, then there's only one possible explanation here. Isaac willingly laid down his life and followed his own father's order in spite of, being, uh, in spite of it being against his own wishes and lay down his life out of obedience to the father. Now, who does that greatly picture? It is undoubtedly Jesus Christ. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. He followed his father's will in laying down and offering his own body as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. This is Jesus Christ speaking here. When you look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, that's Jesus, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Notice Jesus Christ has his own body prepared. This is undoubtedly Jesus Christ. Verse 7, Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. The Son was following the Father's will out of obedience. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By, wit, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Notice right here, Jesus Christ gave up his own body as a sacrifice willingly. This is all a voluntary decision. Isaac, what he did was clearly a voluntary decision. There was no other way Abraham would have been able to bound up Isaac successfully and through following the scriptural rationale of God using pictures where he wants Isaac to follow a lot of the pictorial steps that represent Jesus Christ, that's got to be the explanation. Voluntary decision. Just like Jesus Christ made 
the decision himself to lay down his life. We're going to return to Genesis 22, Genesis chapter 22. Continuing on the chapter, what happened next? Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. So Abraham, he stretched forth his hand, so his arm stretched out. That's the idea. Forth, so it's going to be heading toward, forth the direction where Isaac is, Isaac's body is lying. And took the knife to slay his son. So obviously, that's self-explanatory. He took the knife in order to kill his son. That's a good picture of Jesus Christ where he stretched forth his hands as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. Before the father, uh, when the father was slaying his own son on the cross for us. Verse 11. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Now the angel of the Lord up here, he was calling Abraham twice. Abraham responded, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. So the angel tells Abraham, don't uh, make sure that your hand does not, uh, lay not thine hand, so don't put your hand on the lad. Don't kill him. Don't touch him. Neither do thou anything unto him. Don't do anything to him that will be harmful. For now I know that thou fearest God. So the angel stopped Abraham out of heaven. The angel of the Lord came down, stopped Abraham from killing his son Isaac. Why? Because he realized that Abraham truly feared the Lord. And that's the reason why he was able to go through and he passed the test. Now, some people, especially critics, they might take this as something negative, that, oh, so God was testing Abraham here, where I wonder, pretend this is God up in heaven, God is thinking to himself, I'm wondering, I wonder if Abraham really is terrified of me, is afraid of me more than protecting his own son's life. Let's put that to the test. And then they display that as what a frightful God, what a horrible God, that uh, he would prefer that his own children be terrified and live in fear of him more than loving their own children. What kind of insane narcissist, uh, what kind of insane uh, person would do that? What kind of insane God would do that? Now, the idea is this, if you look at Job 1, that kind of criticism actually showed something interesting. For some of you who don't know, I've taught this in intermediate discipleship, but Job was close to the timeline of Abraham, if not contemporary. He was very close during that time. The reason why is if you look at Job 1.1, uh, there was a man in the land of Uz, and then when you look up the word Uz and make comparisons, it actually is pretty close to uh, the terrain where Abraham uh, was back then. He was from the Ur of the Chaldees, and he was close to that terrain. So Job and Abraham, they were contemporaries, and if not, they were very close to each other's timeline. Being close to each other's timeline, it is interesting that God was testing people that time. You might say, why is that? The reason why is because Nimrod, Babylonia Empire, and paganism was spreading. And if you recall in our Genesis studies, that's why God wanted to separate Abraham and start a new nation with him because the whole world messed up even after the Tower of Babel. They kept, uh, even though they were splitting apart, segregating, dividing, in some mesh they were uniting, and, that's co and that common thread is religion. It's Nimrod's Babylonian religion, Semiramis worship. So God said, I have to start a brand new nation, start a clean slate, and he did it with Abraham. But during that time, he had to test their character and see, I wonder if these people are worthy where I can start my own name, 
my own nation through them. Job was one of them who was tested alongside Abraham. If Abraham was tested by God, which we looked at Genesis 22, verse 1, he was tested by God. That's what the verse said, right? Did Job undergo a test as well? Yes. If you look at Job chapter 1 and verse 6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Now look what God says to Satan. Isn't this interesting? And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that what? Feareth God and escheweth evil. Now look at that. What do you think Satan's going to do? He's going to challenge Job's character of serving God. And that's the reason why God allowed this bad thing to happen and made the test occur for his saint. Verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Abraham fear God for naught? Look, you gave, verse 10, didn't you give him a child and blessed his household and blessed him and increased his, uh, his land? Verse 11, but put forth your hand against his only begotten son and he will curse you to your face. Do you see the similarity here? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm pointing out right here? What I'm pointing out is that what Satan did to Job, he did the same thing to Abraham. That's what I strongly believe in. I'm not going to declare that as doctrine, but I really believe that because I see so much uh, similarities and comparisons here, especially when God said, now I know you fear me. Well, how is he going to do that without testing him? Right. Same thing right here. God's pointing out, now I know that you really fear me. Why? Because of that testing. What do you think Satan does with Abraham? You think Satan's going to sit down behind the scenes and let Abraham prosper, have a good time? Or do you think he's going to do like he's been doing with some of you, if not all of you? So, as soon as you serve God, God starts blessing you. Then he sends, the Satan starts attacking. That's Satan's job. Why? He doesn't want you to enjoy your blessing from God. Because he can't enjoy a single blessing from God. So he wants to steal it for himself. That's his job. Look at verse 1. Verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. You can notice here that Job's integrity, his character was a type that feared God. So fear, in other words, when you follow in line the context here, same thing with Abraham. Let's see. Let's put Job and Abraham's comparisons together. Abraham shared many similarities with Job. Notice, in both chapters, they were tested. Another thing you'll notice is in Job chapter 1, they both feared God. They were close to the same time. and even place. Looking at all these similarities, I clearly see that Satan, he was involved when he tried to challenge Abraham and that he was part of that game where God was saying, well, Abraham, he loves me enough that he'll even give up his only begotten son. That's how much he loves me. And then Satan says, no, I don't believe that. Look at my children. They're throwing their babies in the Ganges River. 
and where they are willing to sacrifice to the crocodiles there, sacrificing for their gods. Abraham, don't love you that much. And God's like, no, I know him. He loves me that much. And Satan's like, you want to bet? And then God's like, sure, let's try it out, okay? And I'm going to point out to you that you're wrong. And Satan's like, no, I don't think so. They all fall. I've seen every single person fall. Uh, I can see ahead that, you know, in 2020, there are even parents who don't take good care of their children at all. And, you know, uh, we live in a generation nowadays where uh, the parents are even spoiling their children rotten. And what do you think Abraham's going to give up his only begotten son? I don't think so. And then God's like, no, I'm going to prove it to you. And then so God takes up the devil's challenge. So Satan, he lost one game with Job, so he's going to try another one. Let's try out Abraham. And God's like, oh, you're just going to lose like last time. You sure you want to play this game? And the, the devil's like, no, I know I'm going to win this one. Who's going to sacrifice his only begotten son? He's past years of age. And Abraham, he fell for my trap before. He feared for his own life and his wife's life that he lied to cover his track. I, I'm, Isaac, oh, there's going to be a lot more pressure now. Sure, Abraham's going to uh, dodge it. I know he will. That's why you have to understand why, what atheists don't realize when they question God, the way God does things in life, they keep blaming on God, but they don't realize the conflict and there's a battle out there. You can't just uh, believe there is a God. You have to believe there is a devil. And if there is a devil, his job, his main goal in life is to cause the suffering, to cause the conflict to make sure that he tries to persuade God to do as much negative things that God can allow upon your life. That's the devil's job. And remember this, he's the second smartest person in the universe next to God. So he's going to find somewhere in God's words. He knows that book more than you do. He's going to find something in there to try to persuade God. I mean, if you can persuade God through prayers when you use the word of God, what makes you think Satan doesn't know some more of that book more than you and find some things to persuade God to do something? All right? So that devil, he's going, that's why he always challenges the Lord and then tries to hold God to his word. You said that when they sin right here that they have to read what they sow. Remember, I know that uh, it's so sad that little children starve to death, but remember, your word said that because of sin, the world has to face starvation. You have to let it happen. If you spare that child, then what about the next child and the next child? Look, I'm not the devil, but the devil, he's talking smarter than me right now up in the throne. His job is to accuse you day and night. You don't read Revelation 12. So before you act like an atheist, before you act spoiled and blame God for everything, uh, why don't you start blaming yourself for the sin yeah. that the devil yeah. uses to take advantage? And if he's so smart and clever, he's going to use that one day to get God's hand to turn against you or to allow suffering to happen in your life. So then Satan was able to get God to test uh, Abraham, if that's the case. What is this word fear? People don't look up the dictionary nowadays. It means to revere, reverence. So it doesn't mean to be terrified. Now, there are quite a few verses that can show that it is a healthy fear. It is to be scared. And, you know, let's be honest. God is all powerful. If, if, you're, if, you don't, if you're not scared of the Lord, then I would be scared if I were you. The reason why you should uh, fear the Lord, and I mean in the terrified sense, is when you commit your sins and then you have no fear of God in you because, oh, God's not going to do anything, then you're going to live like the atheist who mocks God, and that is blasphemy against him. Right. So there should be that healthy fear. However, in this case, there are times in the scriptures that fear means to revere. It doesn't mean to be scared. So when God's saying in Genesis 22 that I know that uh, you fear God, he's not saying that, 
oh, now I know that you're terrified of me. You're so scared that, that I'm going to kill you or do something harmful to you. That's why you d- you're willing to sacrifice your only begotten son. No, that's not what God's saying. God's saying, now I know how much you honor me. You revere me. Besides, offerings are used to worship, to honor, to revere God. That's one. Number two, the context of Job 1, you can see, if we were to go back to Job 1, the context has to do with revering, reverence to the Lord. You might say, why is that the case? It's not talking about being terrified of God. Because look at the devil's challenge. It doesn't make sense if you look at Job 1. At Job 1, verse 9, Satan's, Satan's asking God, does Job really fear you? Didn't you, at verse 10, notice right here, cast a hedge about him, his hout, you blessed him, increased his substance. But in verse 11, you put forth your hand, touch everything that he has, and he will curse thee to thy face. So notice right here, this has nothing to do with being terrified of God. That wouldn't make sense. Because if it's talking about being terrified of God, then when God has all these negative things happen to Job, has him undergo these painful trials, and if Job really lived a life being terrified of God, wouldn't he, after all those bad things happening, sent from God, be more afraid of God? Yeah, exactly. That don't make sense. That's good, Pastor. So we can see here that it has to do with reverence, with honoring God. At verse 10, because Job is so blessed, Satan's saying, well, that's why Job easily worships you. That's why, Lord, Gene Kim easily serves you, because you blessed him too much. What do you think he's going to uh, quit out on you, drop it, when you blessed him so much? But take away this from him, that from him, that from him, he will curse thee to thy face. Okay, go back, go back. Genesis 22, Genesis chapter 22. It's a scary thing you have to realize about that conflict, that battle in heaven. You have an adversary. He is not something to be messed with. What he did with Abraham was to where Abraham was at a point sacrificing his only begotten son. Some of you probably couldn't imagine if uh, one of your loved ones in your family died. And that was part of the challenge. And are you willing to lay that down for the Lord? Are you still going to come to church when God takes that person away from you? Let alone if that person is the only joy, uh, the only begotten son. That might be big. How would you feel about that? Imagine also that you're the father who killed his own child. How are you going to explain to your wife? Okay, go back to Genesis 22. There's, it's a big battle going on, even right now, folks. Even right now. Verse 12, Abraham passed the test. God knows that, he fe- uh, that Abraham fears him. Continuing on the last part of verse 12, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. Notice that God says, I see that you didn't uh, withhold your son. So withhold, he didn't hold back from laying down, offering his son as a sacrifice to God. And notice that God himself says, thine only son. Why does God keep saying, your only son, your only begotten son, your only begotten Just like he said at verse, uh, let's see here, verse 2, he mentions thine only son, your only begotten son whom you love. There is no doubt God, he's seeing a picture ahead of his only begotten son that he's going to sacrifice. It's so strong, Genesis 22. It's so strong. You cannot remain an Old Testament Jew in the church age after reading Genesis 22 knowing about the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. You really can't do that. You have to become a New Testament Christian after reading this story. The last part of verse 12 says, from me. In other words, Abraham didn't refrain from sacrificing his son from, uh, from God. Notice that if the Bible says, from me, if God is saying, 
you didn't withhold your son from me, and this is the angel of the Lord speaking here, that don't make sense that Abraham was offering his son as a sacrifice to an ordinary angel. That the angel says, give your son as a sacrifice to me. No, I wouldn't do that. I'd probably claim Galatians 1 and said, you must be an accursed angel. Be like Martin Luther, throw an inkwell at that. And that actually did happen, believe it or not. I would think that's a false angel. But this is God himself speaking. So in verse 11, the angel of the Lord, that is clearly referring to God himself. We see another verse in the Bible where the angel of the Lord is referring to God himself. So when Jews talk about God has no image, when you're saying Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, you're saying that God has an image, etc., point out the angel of the Lord. How are they going to explain that? The angel of the Lord is the greatest evidence to Old Testament Jew of the deity of Jesus Christ. So you can use that. Now, Genesis 22 is chock full of church age doctrine. You notice that? Chock full of it. You can't be a hyper dispensationalist and chop this part out. Keep reading, verse 13. Here's the fun part. This is the best part. And Abraham lifted up his eyes. Uh, again, that phrase, lifted up his eyes, is referring to that uh, his eyes are down here, but then he lifted up. He, His eyes went up and then he saw something. Something caught his attention. That's what that phrase is meaning. So Abraham saw something and looked and behold, uh, behind him a ram. When Abraham looked, lo and behold, behind him was a ram. Now notice that the Bible says ram. If you know the story... Abraham used the ram as a sacrifice, not his son Isaac. Question people ask. Some of them would use this as criticism. What The Bible says ram, not lamb. But Abraham mentioned that it would be a lamb that God will provide as a sacrifice. Now, this is uh, really good, okay? Yeah. But when you find supposed contradictions, it's actually su- uh, supporting adv- uh, greater revelation. Yeah. And not only that, our atheist friends have uh, supported us, helped us in criticizing the modern version Bible scholars. They are exactly right. If the verse, remember the modern Bible versions, what did they do? The prophecy at verse 8. Did you forget that prophecy? Abraham said God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. He didn't say that God will, uh, that God will provide for himself a lamb. He never said that. God's going to use himself as the lamb. But the modern Bible version says that one word makes a huge difference. Because when you say God will provide for himself a lamb, what does that mean? It's God is not using himself as a sacrificial lamb. God's going to find some other lamb out there to be used as a sacrifice. You know what that means? If that is true, according to the modern Bible versions, God will uh, uh, provide for himself a lamb. And yeah, it did happen. God provided a lamb where Abraham sacrificed. No, it wasn't a lamb. It was a ram. So you know what? There's an error in the Bible. Not the Bible, the modern Bible version trash. There's an error there. You might say, why did God use a lamb? Uh... Why did God use a ram, not a lamb? We're going to jump ahead. It's because of verse 14. This is powerful. In verse 14, and God called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. What did Abraham call this place when he sacrificed that ram? Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? God not has provided. God didn't provide the lamb. God will. Amen. What? Abraham? No, God already provided the lamb for the burnt offering. No, God didn't yet. The prophecy wasn't fulfilled. See, so that ram was not the fulfillment 
of verse 8, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. No, no, no. That's not what it is. When Abraham called it Jehovah Jireh at verse 14, which means God will provide, Abraham's saying that lamb has not been provided yet, yeah. even though that ram was sacrificed. Why? Because it was a ram, not a lamb. Just look at the Bible. There are modern Bible version scholars who try to go around and say, well, ram, what it means is it's an adult male lamb. So in a sense, it was still full. No, no, no. What are you going to do about Jehovah Jireh then? Oh, by the way, we're going by original Hebrew here. Jehovah Jireh, you know. I'm more original Hebrew than the modern Bible version scholars. And they said that we're trying to go as original as we can when we translate the King James Bible failed in this. No, the King James Bible went one up on you on that one. That's what happened. And modern trash versions. Shame for them to be even called the Bible. We can see here that God will provide. That means in that passage that the lamb has not been offered as a sacrifice yet. Yeah. Oh, by the way, this is even better. Modern Bible versions, they would go, God will provide for himself a lamb. And then when they went to verse 14, instead of saying Jehovah Jireh, like original Hebrew like we did, they said, the Lord will provide. Oh. Wow, so they just contradicted themselves. Yeah. You know how, yeah, stupid. I'm going to use that word. It's stupid. You know how stupid that is? It's as stupid as saying El Hanan killed Goliath and then the same passage where you go to Chronicles, they said El Hanan killed the brother of Goliath. Yeah. They just contradicted themselves. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be stupid? Read a modern Bible version. That's how you become stupid. Okay, let's go back right here. Okay, let's look at verse 13. Let's look at verse 13. So, this is a fulfillment of Scripture. This is a beautiful picture as well. Get ready for this. God gave a ram, not a lamb. What is a lamb? Lamb is referring to the child state of the ram. It's the son. The ram is the father yeah. of the lamb. Father. Wow. Why? No, no, no. My only begotten son, the son of God, is going to be that lamb. Not some normal ram right here. My son is specially saved up. This lamb is saved up for my son. The ram has to be referring to the Father. Why? Because it's a picture of God the Father providing, look at this now, providing and helping them out with their salvation. The Father provides the righteousness to the Old Testament saint throughout that entire time, but he can only account it as righteous, especially even when they offer up the sacrifices like a ram. Why? Because it cannot truly take away sins. But God, he has to count it as sins taken away. That's, That's called the salvation of the Father, the righteousness given from the Father, God the Father, through his sacrifices he ordained. But when the Son of God provides his own sacrifice as a lamb, you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, not your own righteousness. And then you, those sins have been cleared away that rams cannot take away. So you know what that's a great picture of? It's a picture of God showing you how he did Old Testament salvation that time. Yeah. Yeah, that's good, brother. The Father gives that righteousness, counts it as righteous, takes away the sin, but it doesn't really take away the sin. He, can, he counts it as forgiveness, but not clearing. That's good, but then when the... Why? Because when that lamb comes through my son, that's when it's cleared, the sins. Okay, look at the comparison. Look at Genesis 15. Notice that Abraham, he was counted as righteous. He was not made righteous, and it was given from the Father. Look at Genesis 15, verse 6. Genesis 15, 6. His sins were not truly cleared. 
He was just counted as righteous and, count, and he was forgiven. Genesis 15, 6, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. See that? I consider you righteous. That's very different from you being truly made righteous. Now look at 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5. Here's the Lamb of God. Here's the Son of God. Christ's righteousness. You saw the Father, how he did it with salvation. Uh, look at the Son here at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Notice at verse 20, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20. The context of verse 20 is Christ, Jesus Christ, correct? If so, then look at verse 21. For he hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, we are made righteous because of Jesus Christ. And that righteousness is the righteousness of Jesus Christ we receive, not our own righteousness, Amen. not our own sin. Look at Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Philippians 1. I told you this would be the best part in today's teaching. Look at Philippians 1. Beautiful picture, Genesis 22, of salvation in Jesus Christ, of the crucifixion, the sacrifice of our Lord. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 11. Verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. Notice that righteousness is from Jesus Christ. Okay, let's go to Genesis. Go to Genesis again. Genesis 22. So it's a ram. The father provides the sacrifice, not the son providing himself as the sacrifice. Let's look at Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. Continuing on, behind him a ram. Notice it says, caught in a thicket by his horns. Notice that the, uh, the ram is caught in a thicket. His horns are caught in there. Now, do you know what thicket is? Thicket, sure, it can refer to shrubbery, but it can also refer to a briar patch. You know what that is? That shows on the ram's head, there's a bunch of thorns stuck in there. Yeah. Wow. I wonder what person had thorns crammed on his head. You know what God was doing? He was showing a picture. He was showing a picture. Go to Genesis, uh, Genesis 3. Remember, the thorn is supposed to represent the curse of sin. So Jesus Christ took the curse of sin on his own head. There's too many pictures, way too many pictures. I mean, you can't remain an Old Testament Jew after reading Genesis 22. You're going to become a New Testament Christian after that. Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. Genesis 3, 18. Notice what's in line with thorns. Look at this at Genesis 3, 18. Thorns also and what? Thistles, isn't that pretty close? Yeah. Shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. And that's a consequence and result of sin at verse 17. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Yeah. Go back to Genesis 22. Stuff, Genesis 22. Praise the Lord. There's way too many pictures on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ here. But then God, he didn't... Uh, do it all the way with the lamb. He's like, no, I want, I want to save that for my son. I want to show them that prophecy that Abraham is saying God will provide himself a lamb. Look at the next part of verse 13. And offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead. So, man, this is awesome right here. In the stead of his son. Meaning, God offered that ram as a burnt offering in the stead, so as a replacement, taking the place of somebody else. So we, there is, it's so uncanny. It's, there is no doubt God was seeing the sacrifice of his son when he was doing this. Remember this, whenever God gives a command, it's supposed to picture something. That's why he wants you to follow his command. Because he doesn't want you to ruin his picture. You know what the price of that is? where Moses couldn't enter the promised land. Yeah. So God takes it very seriously. 
If we see at verse 13, it's un undoubtedly a picture of Jesus Christ taking the pl uh, our place as a sacrifice. He took our place. That should have been me and you yeah. being slain by God. But God slain his only begotten son in our stead. Amen. But here's another thing you can see here. It says in the stead of his son, right? So the ram, the father, it kind of shows deliberately right here that the father is going to be that replacement. That ram is going to be the replacement of the lamb or the son. Why? Because God, does, uh, God did not set up the lamb as a sacrifice yet. So you can see another picture and meaning here in that verse where the Lord's pointing out, no, 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 the Father is still in the salvation business, in the sacrifice business uh, for now. It's not the Son yet. It's not the Son yet. Your time has not come yet. So uh, before you come down, I'm going to be in your stead and just grant the salvation, the forgiveness, and count it to them that way until your time comes. Yes, yes. Look at verse 14. And Abraham called the name of that place Yahweh Jireh. No, it says Jehovah Jireh. Amen. So notice that Abraham, he called this place here Jehovah Jireh. And I already explained what that meant. Amen. It meant uh, God will provide. God will provide. Uh, quick criticism and critique against that word Yahweh. They want to always use the Yah, 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 Yah instead of the J sound because the J sound didn't exist that time then they should do it with every Old Testament character that starts with the J, right. but they didn't do that. Jehoiakim and a, uh, a lot of other stuff, they, didn't, they don't change uh, those to Y. Uh, but this one they do. Why do they do that? That's very strange. And by the way, if uh, you study the word Yahweh, and look, I went to higher ed school as well, they'll point out that it's some kind of desert pagan god, Amen. and that the Jews borrowed it from the Canaanites. So I wouldn't go that far if I were you. I, I heard that Johnny boy, he switched Jehovah to Yahweh in his reference Bible or his Bible. I'm not sure if that's true. But if Johnny Boy did that, then he, he's not as smart as he sounds right there. He should have done a Y for every other J sound in his book. He's not that smart. All right. The, yeah, Yanni Boy, right? He should have changed his ma uh, name to Yon MacArthur, right? Okay. Yahweh. <laughs> yeah, so, anyway, uh, stop. <laughs> let's, let's go to verse 14. Let's, let's, <laughs> the last time I did that, I upset the Calvinist community, and they became famous because of my video critiquing me. <laughs> All right, let's look at verse 14. Yes, I like to rub dirt on Calvinists. I do that. They got so many views thanks to me. They should be thanking me. They got money off of that too if they put ads in there. They should be thanking me. I help pay their rent bills. Some of them are probably losers and they're not married or maybe they're single and they're just uh, computer geeks all day long to troll you. All right, I got to stop, all right? I got to stop. I'm going to upset the Calvinist community and they'll post comments on Reddit again and saying, I graduated from seminary, but this guy critique. Uh, I got to stop, all right. Yeah. All right, verse 14. You know All right, verse 14. As it is said to this day. So Moses is the author here. So up to his time point, that place has been always known as Jehovah Jireh. God will provide. In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. This is utmost proof that if Moses wrote this, and then he said, up to this day it's God will provide, hey, God didn't provide yet, that means. So the modern Bible versions, you got to realize this and point this out to them. Yes, every word is important because you broke Scripture prophecy. That's the violation. You want a proof text? It's Genesis 22, 8. Use that and compare that with verse 14. Use that against them, as I've already explained a long time ago. Modern Bible versions are guilty of breaking Scripture prophecy itself. Amen. When we look at verse 14, as it is said to this day, so up to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. So in God's mountain, you can see it. 
Uh, it could mean two meanings here. One, it could be the Mount of the Lord could be referring to Mount Zion. And then the meaning, possibly, from Mount Zion, you can see that sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Or it could be referring, the mountain of the Lord is Mount Moriah itself. And on Mount Moriah itself, you can see uh, that sacrifice. Let's go to verse 15. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time. So after that sacrifice of the ram... The angel of the Lord calls to Abraham out of heaven again, second time, and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, so the angel is saying here, By me I swore. Notice, saith the Lord. So the angel of the Lord is speaking at verse 15, but at verse 16 is saying, Jehovah speaking. Again, Jehovah, or God himself, the Lord, is the angel of the Lord. God swore by himself because Abraham had done this thing, because he went out by faith, willingly offering his son Isaac as a sacrifice, because he did that thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son. You didn't refrain from offering your son, again, thine only son, your only begotten why would God keep repeating that unless there's a reason behind it? That in blessing, I will bless thee. In the blessing that God gave to Abraham, he will really bless him. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed. Uh, multiplying, where he's going to multiply his seed, he's going to really multiply it, increase it, his offspring, as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. That's how numerous his offspring will be as much as, as, new, as innumerable as the stars in heaven and the sand that you find on the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. His offspring is going to own, possess the, the gate of his enemies, where his enemies live, the entrance of his enemies. That's important because the Israelites, when they went to possess the land of Canaan, they had to battle they had to go in front of their gates so that they can reclaim their homeland. And not only that, in the future tribulation, they have to reclaim what rightfully belongs to them as well, the nation of Israel, against the United Nations when they try to conquer them. Verse uh, 17 is supposedly another contradiction that critics will find. Now, it's amazing. In this one chapter, I find so many criticisms against it. Atheist criticism, agnostic criticisms. I wonder why. Perhaps the devil knows this is the greatest picture of Jesus' sacrifice. Yeah, right. Maybe that's why. I don't know. But another criticism is, well, because Abraham did this deed and this action, God would give the promise to Abraham. But back at Genesis 15, God already promised him that. So then God was a liar. No, that's not the point here. In Genesis 15... When we look at verse 5, God gave that promise to Abraham, but the simple answer is in Genesis 22, God is confirming, especially from Abraham's faithfulness to him. So God's confirming it. It's that simple. Okay, we're done. Next, verse 18. <laughs> and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So through Abraham's offspring, it, the nations around the world, they'll be blessed. Isn't that very true? Yeah. Look at every nation that has take, taken advantage or utilized a Jew yeah. for his or her own gain. Mm -hmm. Think about that for a while. Verse 18 again. Because thou hast obeyed my voice. In verse 18, God says, Based on the reason, you obeyed me because you are a man who lives in obedience. He's done that with Isaac. He's done that at the very beginning when God called him and gave him the promise at Genesis 12. Separate yourself from your homeland. He lived a life of obedience, even though there were some shortcomings here and there. But God considered it overall as obedience. Verse 19, so Abraham returned unto his young men. So Abraham went back to where the young men, remember, they were waiting on the bottom of the mount. 
he took two young men with him and Isaac. So he returned to them. And they rose up and went together to Beersheba. They got up together and they all went together to home again, which is Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Can you imagine uh, what was going on in Abraham and Isaac's mind throughout that whole time? He goes back. How did it go? You know, oh yeah, it went well. God will provide himself a lamb. You meant God has provided, right? No, no, God will provide himself. What are you talking about? It's kind of hard to explain. Let's just go home, you know. Right. Just think and pray on that for a while, you know. Maybe one day the other people might understand it one day. They go back and then Isaac's like, man, that was something. <laughs> <laughs> That was something right there. Man, I, well, I got to hear the Lord. I got to see my father pass the test. Wow, I wonder if I can do the same thing that my dad did for the Lord. Imagine what's going on in Abraham's mind, just going, praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Wow, what a great God you are. You helped me through the fire. You helped me through the suffering. And I... Man, God, you're such a great God. Isn't that what a lot of you did as well? Yes, yes. You can imagine what's going on in his mind. And you can imagine what's going on up in heaven. You can imagine what's going on in the devil's mind. Yeah. The devil just frowns. And then God says, I win. You lose on an only begotten son. Yeah. <laughs> and the devil's like, Rah. well, I'm going to find some other game to win. There were a few places here and there that I won. I'm going to find another one. And God's like, you could uh, win here and there, but I already won the war. Yeah. And one day, you're going to lose again on an only begotten son. What does that mean? Oh, you'll find out soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'll think that you'll be winning, just like right now. You thought that you'll be winning. You thought that Abraham couldn't go through with it. And you're going to think the same way but you're going to be beaten again on an only begotten son. You'll see one day, and the Lord smiles, and I wonder what's going on in the devil's mind and what he's thinking. What's he talking about? i got to dig through the scriptures again. I'm going to look through that book again. I'm going to find something what's going on over there. And then, out, uh, as Dr. Upman's Adler commentary would go, out he went in a puff of smoke. Poof! And then the devil, he went back to Job, working on his wife. Okay, that's quite a dramatic story, isn't it? I mean, can you imagine if you were there real time, real life up in heaven, seeing Job and Abraham going through that test and that battle with God? It's going to be it's something. It's quite something. But imagine so much more with the only begotten Son of God, where he was crucified on that cross. Man, that's something. Again, I recommended you to listen to, ad -lib, uh, to Dr. Upman's ad-lib commentary on that story of Abraham and Isaac. It's quite something. He does a much better job than I do. We'll look at verse 20. And it came to pass after these things. So what happened after all this happened? That it was told Abraham, saying, Abraham uh, heard report from someone who said to him, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. The person says to Abraham, Behold, Milcah, that's the wife of Nahor, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor. So Abraham's brother Nahor got children. Milcah was able, Milcah was able to give birth, uh, give birth to children for Nahor. These are the names of his children. If you recall, Abraham has a brother, Nahor, and it is actually through Nahor that you're going to find out Abraham's son would marry Nahor's uh, offspring. So the Holy Spirit records here, Huz, his firstborn, so the firstborn's name is Huz. Now, I'm going to go through the names here. If I go through the names... Uh, there are, I'm going to give you some of the meanings as well. The interesting notion with Huz, it might have some connection to Uz of Job 1. So we see another parallel again with Job. But what's even stronger than that is the next word. And Buzz, his brother. 
So uh, Huz had a brother uh, named Boaz. Boaz is a reference in Job chapter 32, Elihu the Buzzite. Job 32, Job 32. Look at the book of Job 32, and we'll read verse 2. So Elihu the Buzzite, who was there with Job that time, there's a relationship with him and Nahor's line. Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite. See that? So Elihu is from the offspring of Buzzite. Now, here's another one of the kindred of what? Ram. Now, Ram, go back to Genesis 22 and verse 21. And Kamul, the father of Aram. The next person is Kamul. And Kamul is actually the father of this particular person's name, Aram. Aram, if you uh, trace that Hebrew word with Ram, there's, uh, a lot of it is indistinguishable, actually. So it's reference to the same thing many times. So Aram could be related to Ram as well in Hebrew. So there's no doubt a family connection, so many similarity with Job and Abraham's line. There's so many parallels with this. Now I'm going to go through some of the names here and their meanings. One of the meanings uh, is when we look at, let's see, Hazo, Hazo, but uh, Chi said is first. Uh, Chi said in verse 22 is the next person in la line, possibly the father of the Chaldeans, father of the Chaldeans, but we cannot guarantee that. If he is the father of the Chaldeans, it makes sense. Remember, Abraham came out from the Ur of the Chaldees ancient Babylonia, and a lot of times people would call it uh, Chaldean Babylonian, right, as the years pass by. So there is some kind of relationship. And Hazo, Hazo means vision or seer, vision or seer. So who knows, maybe he turned out to be a prophet at verse 22. And Pildash, Pildash means flame of fire. That's a cool name, all right? If you want to call your boy flame of fire, then uh, call him Pildash, okay? <laughs> and Jidlaf. Jidlaf. If there's someone you don't like or a child you don't like, call him Jidlaf. Why? Jidlaf means melting away. So you can imagine Pidlash fighting with Jidlaf, and Pidlash said, I'm going to burn you and you're going to melt away. And Jidlaf, Jidlaf is probably going, Daddy, he made fun of my name again. <laughs> All right. The next part of verse 22, and Bethuel. Bethuel. Bethuel, he plays a leading part later on. Why is that name important? The next part, verse 23, and Bethuel begat Rebekah, because he is the father of Isaac's wife, Rebekah. These eight did Milcah, uh, di uh, these eight Milcah did bear to Nahor. So these are the eight names that Milcah gave birth for Nahor, Abraham's brother. Okay, verse 24, we'll cover that next time. And there's an interesting note that I'm going to give on verse 24. Amen. Let's close it with a word of prayer. Father God, thank you so much for the gleanings of your word. Oh, what a book. What a great God. Every event and moment in our life, you do it for a particular reason, and it's to represent or to picture something. I pray that we will take what you've given to us seriously, whatever test, whatever experience you, we go through in life, to take it as treasure and as gold so that it can turn into fine gold in the future and glorify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.